Hey guys, Internet Mexican here again, and as you can tell by the length of my hair compared to the last video, it's been a while. In the previous video, we talked about the conspiracy of Valladolid and how the conspirators wished to overthrow the government of New Spain for the purpose of running Mexico independently from the Spanish Empire. Now, although they wanted Mexico independent from the Spanish Empire, they still wanted Mexico to be under the rule of King Ferdinand VII, which had been forced to abdicate his throne by Napoleon, after Napoleon went ahead and put his brother Joseph Bonaparte on the Spanish throne. However, the conspiracy was ultimately betrayed by a young military officer known as Agustín de Turbide. The failure of the Valladolid conspiracy, however, did not dissuade other would-be revolutionaries from planning their own revolutionary movements. The arrest and punishment of the Valladolid conspirators, along with the overthrow of Viceroy José de Iturrigaray, would actually further push more predominantly criollo revolutionaries towards action. And today we're covering one of these revolutionary groups. We're going to be talking about the Querétaro Conspiracy. So Spain is under French occupation after Napoleon Bonaparte forced the abdication of the Spanish monarchy and then placed his own brother Joseph Bonaparte on the Spanish throne. In response, several juntas sprang up across the Spanish Empire in order to organize resistance against French occupation. This includes also the Americas. New Spain, we begin to see tensions as Criollos fear that predominantly Peninsular local government may ultimately cede control of New Spain to the French. Some may argue that in reality, the frustration from the Criollo class actually arose from the fact that although they were a part of the upper echelons of society as outlined by the caste system, they were still below Peninsulares. Many Criollos felt that their hard work and dedication had only obtained them meager rewards when compared to their Peninsular counterparts. This feeling most likely arose from the fact that Peninsulares dominated government administrative jobs, trade, and usually had easier access to the most lucrative positions in New Spain. Now, although Criollos were not doing too bad for themselves, they felt that Peninsulares were unfairly advantaged with policies being put into place which continuously seemed to favor Peninsulares over Criollos. Many Criollos thus felt that there was a growing division between these two classes of Spaniard, and they felt that they were getting the short end of the stick. For example, since we're talking about Querétaro, in the 1800s, Querétaro was the seat of a very prosperous district. It was New Spain's fourth largest city. It was the leading manufacturer of wool and textiles, the leading producer of corn and wheat, as well as the leading producer of tobacco products. Criollos did not get to share equally in that prosperity. In fact, although Peninsulares only made up a quarter of the total population of Querétaro, they dominated commerce and trade, they held the highest paid and most prestigious positions in the local government, and they monopolized the highest ranks in the local militia. With the wealth that they accumulated through their systemically guaranteed privilege, Peninsulares could then afford to own obrajes and the best haciendas, which only further increased their wealth, prosperity, and influence in the region. Movements like the Valladolid Conspiracy sought to change the power dynamic in New Spain, taking the power from Peninsulares' hands and placing it in the hands of Criollos. And these efforts to change New Spain's power dynamic didn't end when Valladolid was discovered other movements, such as the Querétaro Conspiracy, began to spring up and continued to change this power dynamic in favor of the Criollo class. The Querétaro Conspiracy was led by Miguel Hidalgo, Juan Aldama, Ignacio Aldama, Mariano Abasolo, Miguel Dominguez and his wife Maria Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez, and Jose Maria Sanchez and Ignacio Allende. Just a little bit about the conspirators. Now, Miguel Hidalgo was the parish priest of the town of Dolores, having acquired the position in 1803 after the death of his brother Joaquin, who had previously served as Dolores' priest. It's unclear when exactly Hidalgo joined the conspiracy, however, it is known that he came into contact with the conspirators after his arrival in Dolores. Hidalgo was more than just a committed member of the conspiracy. Hidalgo would actually go on to become the leader of the conspiracy due to his charismatic nature. Hidalgo is said to have gone along with people of all castes, able to gain the admiration and respect of people from all walks of life. His position as parish priest also made him very valuable due to the clout that it gained him with the common folk. Hidalgo's charisma was likely a result of his upbringing. He grew up on his father's hacienda where he was exposed to people of various racial and cultural backgrounds. Hidalgo grew up playing with uh, the children of the predominantly indigenous uh, ranch hands and servants that lived on his father's property. So this exposure with people of various cultural and racial backgrounds uh, softened his outlook on the so-called lower castes. It's likely that Hidalgo's upbringing had the effect of ridding him of a lot of the racial prejudices that were common among New Spain's white population at the time. 
And this is likely why Hidalgo is said to have actually made an effort to learn uh, the tongues and cultural customs of local indigenous populations. Uh, specifically, it's said that he actually made an effort to master a lot of the local languages because at the time, the priests in New Spain were actually required to learn local indigenous languages to better reach out to local indigenous communities, but many of them only made a half-hearted attempt to actually master these languages, where Hidalgo is said to have been quite proficient in languages such as uh, Nahuatl or Otomi. And aside from his more liberal approach to issues of race, Hidalgo also came from a very successful Spanish family and was a criollo himself. Hidalgo's own racial background and status in the caste system is important to note as it helped quell the fears of more conservative members of the conspiracy that the movement may move too radically away from tradition. The fact that Hidalgo came from a respectable Spanish family also benefited him as it served to help avoid suspicion as there was no reason to believe that someone like Hidalgo may betray their social class. Another member of the conspiracy is Ignacio Allende, an officer of the Spanish military of New Spain. Ignacio was born in the town of San Miguel el Grande, his father being a well-respected Spanish merchant. However, early on in Ignacio's life, his father would pass away, leaving him and his family in the care of one of his business partners, who provided enough for the family to live honorably, as it was put. Allende first joined the military in 1795 and would reach the rank of captain in 1808 after being given command of the Queen's Provincial Dragoons. Before the Querétaro Conspiracy, Allende had also taken part in the Violet Conspiracy, being one of the members who managed to avoid being sanctioned for his involvement in that movement. Juan Aldama and Ignacio Aldama were two other members of the conspiracy. Like Allende, the two brothers were also from San Miguel el Grande. The Aldama brothers would often travel to Querétaro to partake in conspiratorial meetings held by Miguel Dominguez and his wife, Maria José Ortiz de Dominguez. Juan Aldama was the captain of a cavalry regiment, while Ignacio Aldama was a lawyer and entrepreneur. And it was through their attendance of conspiratorial meetings in Querétaro that they would come to meet Ignacio Allende and Miguel Hidalgo. Mariano Abasolo, another member of the conspiracy, was born in the town of Dolores. Like Ignacio Allende, he had been involved in the conspiracy of Valladolid and had also managed to escape punishment. And soon after the Valladolid conspiracy had been disbanded, Abasolo became involved with the Querétaro conspiracy. He was one of the youngest conspirators at only 26 years old. He was also one of the wealthiest conspirators, having inherited a fortune from his father, as well as marrying the daughter of a rich Peninsular landowner. Now, Abasolo's contribution to the movement was mostly financial, although he did partake in some of the combat later on once the war began. Now, needless to say, his wife coming from a Peninsular family, she was totally against his involvement in the independence movement. From what I've been able to find, at least she didn't snitch, so I mean, I guess at least she was ride or die. The last and one of the most important men in the conspiracy was the Corregidor of Querétaro himself, Miguel Dominguez. Miguel Dominguez had been appointed to the position of Corregidor, or a magistrate, in 1801 by the Viceroy of New Spain at that time. At the time, Querétaro was one of the most financially stable and successful cities in New Spain. So as Corregidor of Querétaro, Miguel Dominguez was one of the most powerful men in New Spain. Dominguez's position as corregidor is also notable for the fact that he was a criollo, and positions of such prestige were often reserved for peninsulares. However, by all accounts, Dominguez executed his duties honestly, such as when he went about making improvements to the city while also upgrading the city's police force. In 1808, he was also able to mitigate the effects of a famine by mobilizing some of the city's grain reserves in order to ensure that the population would be able to have enough to eat. Dominguez's actions during the famine won him the admiration of the lower caste, which often faced the brunt of economic crises. But just as he gained the admiration of lower castes through his actions, Dominguez also gained a lot of enemies from wealthier members of the upper castes. You see, early on in his career, Dominguez was commissioned to investigate the working conditions in the colony's obrajes, obrajes being a type of workshop such as uh, textile shops. Uh, and these workshops were often owned by peninsulares. Dominguez's report found that working conditions in these places were often deplorable, and he pulled no punches in his assessment of the conditions of New Spain's obrajes. Dominguez reported that workers were underfed and were often physically and emotionally abused. Workers were often overworked in unsafe and unsanitary working environments, while also being brutally punished for even the most minor infractions. The report also talked about how a lot of these workers would fake injuries or illness in order to avoid having to work in these deplorable conditions and stated that obrajes were the last strongholds of slavery in New Spain. 
Now, Dominguez's reports and his later attempts to improve the working conditions within the Obrajes did not endear him to the upper class members which owned these establishments. Dominguez also managed to piss off Viceroy Jose de Iturrigaray to the point where Iturrigaray would ultimately have Dominguez removed from his position as Corregidor. This was the result of Dominguez writing a protest against the Viceroy's implementation of the Law of Consolidation, which had resulted in the appropriation of some of the Catholic Church's assets, some of which went to the Viceroy's personal enrichment. Unfortunately for the Viceroy, the Audiencia, which was the highest court in New Spain, got involved on the behalf of Miguel Dominguez, likely due to his positive record uh, of service as the Corregidor of Querétaro. The Viceroy was then forced to restore Dominguez to his position as Corregidor while also being forced to give him back pay for lost wages while he was removed from his position. Now, funny enough, despite their beef, Dominguez would ultimately decry the pro-Spanish coup that removed Iturrigaray from power. Dominguez's wife, which we will just call Doña Josefa, was said to be even more committed to the movement of independence than her husband. Doña Josefa is said to have been empathetic towards the oppression endured by New Spain's indigenous people, while also feeling angry over what she perceived as the treatment of criollos as second-class citizens. I don't really think you could compare the treatment of criollos and Mexico's indigenous populations, but I mean, I, at least she was empathetic, I guess. Doña Josefa would ultimately find herself involved in the Querétaro conspiracy, where she would convince her husband to host meetings in their homes, as well as attending meetings in the homes of Jose Maria Sanchez. These meetings often being disguised as meetings of like literary societies in, in an attempt to avoid suspicion. And it is through these meetings that the Dominguez's would meet people like the Aldama brothers or Ignacio Allende and Miguel Hidalgo. Ultimately, the conspirators were set their date for the revolution to be October 1st, 1810, but they had a problem. And it was the same problem that the Valle conspirators had, and that's that they did not have the numbers to launch their revolution. They did not have the manpower. And like the Valle conspiracy before them, they knew that if they wanted this revolution to succeed, they had to mobilize the lower castes in favor of the revolution. Specifically, they sought to target the indigenous population of New Spain to support the revolution. And just like Valladolid, one of their initial plans for winning over popular support from the indigenous populations was to offer them relief from tribute payments. However, tribute payments may not have been enough to win over the support of the indigenous peoples and other lower castes of Mexico. Now, as we mentioned earlier, one of the intentions of this revolution was to wrestle power away from the peninsular class and hand it over to the criollo class, as criollos felt that they were being marginalized, and that despite their hard work and dedication, they were not achieving the same levels of success as peninsulares, because they felt that the system was set more in favor towards peninsulares at their own detriment. However, they obviously knew that they wouldn't gain popular support if they made their true intentions public. That being that they wanted to seize that control from Peninsulares and hand it over to themselves. And they wouldn't win that popular support if they made their true intentions clear because the conspirators' intentions obviously had no inherent benefits for the lower castes that were even lower on the totem pole than the criollos were. With lower castes often being relegated to the least prestigious and lowest paying positions in society. The conspirators would also find it hard to argue for the revolution given that many of the lower castes actually had a deep affection for the Spanish monarchy. And the fact that the lower caste or that the indigenous peoples of Mexico had an affection for the monarchy is something that often surprises people. But when you think about it, it's really not all that surprising at all. Since the conquest of New Spain, the people of the vice royalty were often reassured that their king cared for all of his subjects. Many in New Spain believed the king to be a sort of divine father figure who had the best interest of his subjects at heart when issuing his orders and decrees. Any negative consequences to the king's orders were usually attributed to those charged with the execution of their orders, as it was no doubt their own self-interest and incompetence that was to blame for the negative consequences. And so the admiration for King Ferdinand VII meant that the popular support for a revolution would require more than the promise of relief from tribute, and would definitely not be achieved for the sole purpose of removing Peninsulares from power solely to replace those people with criollos. The lower castes would not risk their lives to simply remove one privileged caste and move them lower at the benefit of another privileged caste, or at least another caste more privileged than them. So the conspirators came up with a solution. If the lower castes would not fight solely for the benefit of independence from Spain, then perhaps they could be convinced to fight if they were made to believe that it was for the benefit of the king and church. Essentially, the solution to their problem was marketing. 
selling the revolution as a revolution of preserving the king's rule over Mexico and the church's position within their society. The movement was sold as a battle in defense of tradition, in honor of the king which had been forced to abdicate, and in defense of the church whose influence had been imperiled by the atheistic French. Now, as the conspiracy tried to gain popular support from the lower castes, Hidalgo was also considering alternative plans. Hidalgo believed that perhaps the movement wouldn't require the mobilization of the populace to a large extent if they were able to gain sufficient support from members of the military. In fact, it was preferable if they can gain support from members of the military as opposed to having to rely on lower castes for their support as many members of the military were criollos and thus the same social class as the conspirators. If they relied predominantly on the labor of the lower caste, then they would need to ensure that their victory was quick and decisive, achievable before the lower caste realized the conspirators' true intentions and abandoned the revolution or demanded more concessions be made in their favor. However, if they relied solely on criollo military men, they wouldn't need to worry if their victory took some time, as those fighting would be the same social class as them, and thus no extra concessions would need to be made to the lower castes, further preserving most of the influence in favor of the criollo class. On September 12, 1810, Miguel Hidalgo invited a man named Juan Garrido to a get-together at his home, along with several sergeants from Guanajuato. Hidalgo informed these men of the plan to launch a revolution for New Spain's independence and offered them high-ranking roles in the rebel army should they offer their support. The men appeared perceptive to the conspirators' plans, and thus Hidalgo offered them about 70 pesos in order to bribe their own men to join the cause. Now, despite Garrido's apparent interest in the plot, he later reported the entire conversation to his superiors as soon as he arrived back in Guanajuato. Garrido's report would lead to the intendant of Guanajuato ordering that all mentioned in Garrido's report be placed under surveillance. Garrido's report was unfortunately not the only leak that threatened to destroy the conspiracy. In fact, the conspiracy had actually been hemorrhaging information for some time, with some sources stating that the leaks had been happening since August. Ultimately, it would be the untimely death of a priest named Manuel Irriaga that would lead to the unraveling of the whole conspiracy. Manuel Irriaga was one of the conspirators responsible for planning the launch of the Querétaro Revolution. Unfortunately, he was terminally ill. And while on his deathbed, Irriaga would go on to confess his involvement in the conspiracy to a Franciscan friar named Francisco Bueras. On his deathbed, Iriaga gave away the names of the conspirators, their roles in the conspiracy, as well as much of the plan on how the conspirators planned to carry out the revolution. Buenas believed that such information was worth the violation of his vows of confidentiality in terms of confessions, and immediately reported what he was told to an ecclesiastical judge named Rafael Gil de Limon. The judge listened as he was told of how hundreds of conspirators were to take part in a revolution against the government of New Spain, and that the planned date of the attack was September 13th, although as we mentioned earlier, the actual planned date of attack was October 1st. He was told that there were two large weapon stashes in the city of Querétaro. Irriaga's confession stating that these stashes were held in the homes of a man named Samano and another named Epigmenio Gonzalez. Most scandalous of all was the accusation that the corregidor of Querétaro himself was involved in the plot. Judge de Leon actually happened to be acquainted with Miguel Dominguez and actually informed the corregidor of the troubling accusations which had been made against him. Dominguez had no choice but to act as if though he knew nothing about it. He feigned surprise. His position as corregidor compelled him to investigate the accusations which had been made in Irriaga's confession and thus he ordered that those named be placed under investigation. At this point, Dominguez went into full damage control and did what he could to mitigate the damage of Iriaga's confession. Knowing that the conspiracy was unraveling, Dominguez rushed home in an attempt to keep his wife from attempting to escalate the situation. By all accounts, she was incredibly devoted to the cause of Mexican independence, so in an attempt to keep his wife safe by preventing her from further escalating the situation, Dominguez locked her up. He locked her up in their bedroom at their home and he was moving as fast as he could in order to not only keep himself and his wife alive, but also to protect as many of the conspirators as he could. Unlike with the Valladolid conspiracy, he knew the Querétaro conspirators would receive no leniency once they were captured. So after ensuring that his wife was safely locked up in their room, Dominguez went out to investigate the homes of Epigmenio Gonzalez and Samano. Dominguez was accompanied by a court clerk who, unbeknownst to Dominguez, was aware of the corregidor's involvement in the plot. The clerk played along with the corregidor's investigation in an attempt to gather evidence against him to later have him arrested. 
However, before any of that would go down, the clerk met up with the corregidor with about 40 men, with the plan being that these men would be split into two teams, one to search Samano's house and one to search the house of Gonzalez, both uh, investigations occurring at the exact same time. The corregidor and the clerk, accompanied by about 20 men, then went to the house of Epigmenio Gonzalez. Once at Gonzalez's home, Dominguez would attempt to rush towards the door in an attempt to alert Gonzalez of the investigation. Now, the clerk intervened in Dominguez's attempt to reach the door, instead insisting that before they attempted to make contact with Gonzalez, that all their guards be placed strategically around the property. At this point, Gonzalez became aware of the fact that his house was about to be raided and refused to open the door, but ultimately let the men in after the men threatened to violently force their way in. Then after getting access to Gonzalez's house, Dominguez attempted to do a quick walkthrough of the home in hopes that any signs of rebellion may be missed by the investigators. But again, the clerk was not having it. The clerk demanded that all the guards be allowed to perform a thorough walkthrough of the property. The second, more thorough search of the home led to the discovery of several weapons, as well as several men caught in the process of manufacturing more weapons for the revolution. At this point, Miguel Dominguez had no choice. He ordered the arrest of Gonzalez and the other conspirators on the property. So at the same time as these investigations were going on, Doña Josefa was already executing her own contingency plan to alert the fellow conspirators of the coming danger. See, Doña Josefa was no fool, and she knew that if something were to go wrong, she may end up finding herself held prisoner in her own home by her own husband. Surely, it was done in an attempt to look out for her best interests, but Doña Josefa was no damsel in distress. After all, that's why they called her La Corregidora, and she was just as much a member of the conspiracy as her husband was. So knowing that she might find herself in this predicament, Doña Josefa had actually already made an arrangement with another conspirator, a man named Ignacio Perez. And this arrangement was a signal that she would use to get his attention if she found herself locked away in her home and unable to reach anybody outside. Once he heard this signal, he was to come to the window in order to see what it is that she needed. And the plan worked. Doña Josefa managed to get Ignacio Perez's attention, after which she informed him that the conspiracy had been compromised and that it was likely that an arrest order was already being issued against all those conspirators that were named in the priest's testimony. As soon as he heard this, Perez was on it. He went to put the word out immediately that the conspiracy had been discovered. And so, in the late night hours of September 15, 1810, Ignacio Perez set out on a 40-mile journey to San Miguel el Grande in order to inform Ignacio Allende and Juan Aldama about the government uncovering their plan. After Allende and Aldama were informed of what had happened, they rode 20 miles north to Dolores to inform Miguel Hidalgo and plan their next move. As Allende and Aldama rushed to Dolores to inform Miguel Hidalgo what had happened, Miguel Hidalgo was actually enjoying a nice, quiet evening with friends. Hidalgo was hosting some of Dolores' most distinguished residents in his home on the night of September 15th, playing cards, enjoying a little bit of conversation and drink. However, it's said that Miguel Hidalgo had a habit of going to bed at around 11 p.m. And by the time that he called it a night, the corregidor and his wife were actually being arrested for their part in the Querétaro conspiracy. Their guilt being proven after a search of their home yielded several letters between Dominguez and Hidalgo outlining the conspiracy and their plan to overthrow the government and make Mexico independent. And it is once this correspondence was found and Irriaga's confession was now proven to be true that arrest orders were issued against every member of the conspiracy that had been named in the confession and that had been outlined in the papers that were found in the corregidor's house. Juan Aldama and Ignacio Allende made it to Dolores at around 2 a.m. on September 16, 1810, and immediately went to wake up Hidalgo and inform him of the situation that they were in. They informed him that the government had discovered the conspiracy, and that it's likely that an arrest order had already been issued for all those associated with the conspiracy. At this point, Hidalgo deduced that the conspirators had two options. One, the conspirators could attempt to flee and go into exile in an attempt to buy themselves a little bit more time. Or two, the conspirators could opt to take the preparations they've made up to this point and launch the revolution early. To Hidalgo, the choice was clear. The revolution had to begin that morning. And so he began to issue his orders and get the ball rolling. First off, Hidalgo summoned everybody who had committed themselves to the revolution and had them begin to retrieve whatever weapons they had already stockpiled. 
Allende went on to mobilize the soldiers under his command, which had committed themselves to the cause. Men were then sent out to arrest Dolores Peninsulares, many of which had been in attendance of Miguel Hidalgo's party just the night before. Groups of men were then also sent out to the cities of Guanajuato, Guadalajara, Mexico City, in order to raise the cry of revolt and mobilize their local revolutionaries. And finally, Miguel Hidalgo called that the church bells in Dolores be rung as if calling people to mass. And by 8 o'clock in the morning, several hundred people had already gathered around to see what Hidalgo had to say. On the morning of September 16th, 1810, Miguel Hidalgo addressed the crowd in his now famous cry of Dolores, or the Grito de Dolores. Unfortunately, Miguel Hidalgo's exact words were not recorded, and what exactly was said at that speech is not clear. Most accounts state that Hidalgo accused the government of Mexico City of actively planning to cede control of New Spain to the French usurpers. Hidalgo is said to have stated that it was the duty of all Mexicans to rise up and defend their home from being turned over to the French by the predominantly peninsular elites, and that he framed the revolution as a war of defense of the church and in honor of Ferdinand VII. He is also said to have promised wages to anybody who would fight in the rebel army, as well as extended any indigenous members of the revolution relief from tribute payments. Hidalgo is said to have ended his speech with the words, Long live Ferdinand VII, long live America, long live religion, and death to bad government. And with these words, Mexico's war for independence had begun. And we thank you guys for watching. In the next video, we'll cover the war as it progresses, as well as some of the main players during the War of Mexican Independence. We've already covered Vicente Guerrero and Agustin de Turbide, but those are only two of the more important figures in this war. There's actually a lot more that we can cover. Now remember, if you like this video, you want to learn more about Mexican history in general, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, maybe leave the video a like, and also leave in the comments any topics on Mexico's War for Independence that you might want me to cover. Also, if you like the video and you'd like to help the channel grow, don't forget to share the video. Let's spread Mexican history around and get this to all our people. Now, other ways that you can support the channel will be posted down below in the description. For instance, I recently made a Patreon account. The Patreon is 100% free. You do not need to pay for it. Anything I post on there will be accessible by everyone. Mexican history is our history and will not be put behind a paywall. However, do consider that I do work on these videos on my own time, so if you would like to support the channel, there is a $3 a month subscription on there that is completely optional. You do not need to subscribe to it to access any of the articles or anything that I write uh, as far as Mexican history. Again, nothing will ever be put behind a paywall. It's completely freely accessible, but if you would like to support that channel, that option is there for you. Um, again, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.